Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome to Web3 Warriors, episode 72, featuring Renz Chong. Thanks for joining us, Renz. He's a co-founder and CEO of BreederDAO, which is a leading, pioneering Web3 gaming organization. And I'm really excited to have you here to be able to ask you some questions about Web3 gaming and kind of where I see things evolving. Uh, thanks for joining, Renz. How are you doing? I'm good luck and thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to share it with your community as well and to just chat with you in general. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining. This is Web3 Warriors. My name is David Chroma, your host. I go by Chrome in the metaverse. And I want to thank you for joining us. As always, we're just pushing the space forward, focusing on the creator economy in the Web3 space, the power of the technology to change lives and open up opportunities and really advocate for kind of the power of the technology more so than the potential for financial gain or some of the other kind of messaging that you hear in the Web3 and NFT corners. Um, and with that, today we're going to be talking about a topic that we love to revisit from time to time, and that is Web3 gaming, the potential for the metaverse, the potential for gaming as we know it, which is a multi-billion dollar, if not trillion dollar industry, and how it can evolve into this blockchain and crypto space and actually take advantage of this new reality, which is that digital assets assets can be given real world value on the blockchain, you know, and we've spoken to a lot of creators, uh, wearables developers, 3D builders, and just really inspiring builders in the space in Web3 and in the metaverse that have shown us the power of what's possible when you connect the blockchain to the gaming space. So it's going to be really cool to be able to speak to Renz here about, you know, what's the importance of A, having a DAO, having an organization and community that's committed to Web3 gaming and committed to pushing things forward. And, you know, what are some of the hurdles that we feel? face. Um, I think in the Web3 gaming space, you find this interesting intersection of gamers and developers and artists, and of course, some traders who are maybe speculating a little bit and want to be able to flip some assets and hope that they make some money. There's a little bit of that too, you know? And what I've heard a lot of, because I was a gamer before I was in Web3, before I got into blockchain and crypto, and I still hear it to today, is a lot of concern around, you know, why should gaming be um, something that you earn money from necessarily? Like, of course, we know there are constant content creators and real professional quote unquote gamers who are able to make a lot of money already in gaming right but should the actual act of playing a video game always earn you some money you know i think it's an open debate still and so there's a lot of pushback in the gaming space you know to that concept but on the flip side we know we're making you know gaming companies gaming industry corporations uh, a lot of money right so why shouldn't we get a little bit of that back and more so the creators, right? The 3D builders, the people that are actually creating the digital assets that we all enjoy. Right now, they're kind of getting the short end of the stick because the big corporations take the lion's share of the profits, right? So in this new world where you can actually create something from scratch, sell it as a digital asset in a video game that people are already enjoying and loving, you know, you can imagine how that could potentially have a flywheel effect and really create a whole new world of opportunities in the gaming space. And so that's how we're kind of pushing back against this concept of like, oh, it's all about money. It's all about, you know, making every video game, you know, pay you. I don't think that's necessarily what it's about. I think it's just about, you know, realizing new value in the gaming space. Uh, so with that, I could go on for a long time about thoughts on Web3 gaming, but we've got a real expert here, Renz, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Um, so before we get into BreederDAO and your organization and what you're working on, uh, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background on, you know, what brought you to Web3, what brought you to blockchain, and thank you again for joining. Welcome. Sure, happy to. I'm actually going to lead with what you said earlier, which is the power of blockchain um, in terms of like changing lives, because that's one of the reasons that I'm why 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 I actually got into the space even. So maybe just to provide some history, right? I'm an ex consultant, uh, did a lot of like back end work for a lot of like these huge corporations, ended up realizing that, you know, the impact that I'm doing isn't making much of a dent, uh, aside from putting monies uh, to, to the rich, right? So I eventually realized that, you know, maybe the real impact is actually uh, in startups, right? Where I get to really explore and touch lives of like, um, bigger or, or like even smaller individuals, right? So um, one that's most prominent that I actually joined would be Ancas, which is a back riding service here in the Philippines. And in a way, um, it actually provided for an alternative mode of transportation for people here. Um, and you can imagine because of the road and traffic situation here, where it takes us maybe 
an hour to get uh, or to drive like six kilometers. Um, it's wow. actually, there's a lot, actually a lot of like lost uh, in terms of like uh, efficiency and like uh, money um, just for transportation. So having a better means of transportation is actually very crucial here, especially if we want to improve the lives of um, ordinary individuals. And so, you know, that really inspired me to actually do something um, more for people right and so i jumped since then i jumped from one startup to another until i eventually landed in or i learned about like actually infinity now for context i've been trading crypto myself um since 2017 nice. but you know back in 2019 i learned about DeFi, and then eventually learned about Axie infinity yeah. what's interesting is that i think a lot of people already know this that you know during the pandemic a lot of people lost their jobs here in the Philippines and Axie Infinity kind of became like, you know, the knight in shining ar armor of a lot of individuals <laughs> where, you know, to be able to sustain their daily lives, they were playing, right? And it kind of became like a thing here um, where instead of, you know, doing a nine to five job or a nine to six job, people would just play and they get to earn some money, which was quite an interesting concept because, why would someone you know pay you just to actually play a game right and so that kind of concept appealed to me and um personally i'm a, i'm an avid gamer myself and one of my biggest frustrations is that every time i purchase an asset from a particular game and we all know it's a cycle within games that after some time you get bored and you move on from like a game right yeah you got nothing to do with your assets like news about like Call of Duty, for example, um, migrating um, to to a different version, and then you not being able to bring your stuff right from from one platform to another, or news about like CS:GO um, selling a lot of these assets for seven figures, right? Yeah, it's but wild. But you don't really own them, right? So what is happening? And here comes Axie Infinity, which actually shows you, you know, that these assets that you generate are ultimately yours and you can do whatever it is that you want with regards to it. And so that kind of concept really just clicked to me. And being situated in the Philippines helped a lot because you see left and right people are asking for assets, asking for axes. axes. Um, everyone's creating their own guild. And so when we saw that phenomenon, we were like, you know, why don't we actually become the supplier for most of these guilds, right? Uh, eventually, if everyone wants to get into this game, then they need to have like a provider for all of these assets. And we became that. So that's the that's the birth of like Breeder Dow in general. No doubt. So a little bit inspired by Axie Infinity. I definitely should have mentioned off the top that you're joining us from Philippines. So that's really cool. As we're always a global show, we've spoken to a few different people in uh, East Asia, you know, Southeast Asia before. So it's always great to touch base and uh, from a different corner of the world for sure. Um, yeah, everything you said makes a lot of sense. You know, I have my criticisms of Axie Infinity. You know, I think the criticism has always been that it should be a little more fun and a little less just grinding away, but at least they made them cute, right? So that, that's it's got to count right, for something. Right. <laughs> uh, no, that's awesome. And you mentioned guilds as well, which I actually had a question about because when I was looking around your site, you know, they seem to play a pretty major role. Can you define maybe for the audience a little bit, you know, what is a guild maybe in the gamer context? And then we can talk about how they're important in the Web3 gaming space. Right. So a guild is basically a clan, right? Your group um, that would actually help you depending on what kind of genre, what kind of game type you're actually playing, right? If it's an MMO RPG, usually you use them to actually go in raids, kill bosses and the like, right? Now, in the context of Web3, they kind of change it in a way because um, initially when Axie Infinity kind of started and all of these like play to earn kind of like uh, started as well, um, there was a huge friction, right? In terms of having to buy an asset in order to play. Right. Uh, Free to play was a thing, but you know, with Web3, because you own your asset, you technically need to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because at one point, I think the, the, the price of the assets uh, in order to create or in order to play an Axie, you reached like $800, right? People yeah. were like, you know, I'm an ordinary Filipino, my minimum wage a month doesn't even reach that, right? So, why would I invest like maybe $800 if my, if my monthly wage is only $300? Right. And so, 
guilds were kind of created in the sense that they would immediately or they would actually front the cash necessary to create these assets and then do a revenue sharing with an individual or a scholar as they call it ah. right so that 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 became like the start of the guilds that that you know YGG and all the rest kind of like uh, created within the space although i think a lot and i believe that a lot of these guilds weren't just providing simply financial services to 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 a lot of these individuals it became some sort of community as well right right um, that's what i was going to ask that was going to be my follow up cuz I, I didn't realize that financial component of it and how that played yeah, in with web3 it was actually pretty huge it's why 99% of like the guilds are actually or have actually closed down shop because it was a pure monetary incentive mm. now the guilds that have retained like the, the guilds that have uh retained or are uh, do, do still exist right now mm. have like a different aspect to it where it's really driven by community if you want to learn about Axie Infinity, if you want to learn about web3 then join my guild because i'm here to actually help you and educate you and to you know tell you like how you can actually not only make money but how you, this can actually help your daily life right or how this can you know eventually be meaningful to you so you i think the, the the context of guild at least when it blew up kind of became super centric just like with play to earn in general right it became or, or the entire web3 concept was siloed <laughs> to the idea yeah, of you speculation know, having, took over everything <laughs> right right which you actually mentioned as well and and it's mm. pre precisely why there's a huge criticism or a drawback around web3 gaming and the power of blockchain through gaming because it became like a, a trading or a speculate uh, a speculation game right mm -hmm. like it wasn't gaming people weren't playing it because they wanted to play in fact i know a lot of people who would enter the game right from the get-go and then exit once people start entering the actual game because then they would think that you know oh it's already the top right and so wow. it wasn't game uh, it wasn't really game first yeah um, it wasn't like let's go yeah. have fun it was like let's speculate and hope to make some money jump yeah, in yeah, and yeah. then let's leave have fun <laughs> money, you know? yeah someone's got to be my exit liquidity i'm getting out of here <laughs> right, right, right. and that's why a lot of people got discouraged mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so what do you think is the remedy for that then right like how do you see web3 gaming kind of evolving i guess best case scenario right so you know there's a lot of thoughts about like people not distinguishing between a web 2 and a web 3 and i personally do agree that you know it, it's not like web 3 actually brings a new genre of game right right there's just like a new component and an innovation where people get to kind of like own their assets and it's verifiable on chain so um you as a gamer would feel confident that uh, whatever asset you're actually buying is really yours and you can do whatever it is that you want with it right so mm. school of thoughts involved maybe not even mentioning anything to do with like nfts it's just a given fact that eventually people would want to own their assets just how like in real life you know you have all of these collectibles you have all of these assets and you know it, it's not like once the developer says or once the creator says that i'm going to stop shipping these products I'm going to have to collect like all of those back right and you know i'm just gonna burn them all right mm. it's up to you um whether or not to keep it right and so you know following that same thought right um i kind of believe that eventually blockchain isn't even gonna be something or even nfts right these are things that we wouldn't have to explicitly say that you know my game now offers nfts yeah. all of these assets are nfts and you can like freely trade them because it's a it's already something that people accept as a fact as part of like gaming in general that because i actually spent money for this one or i actually worked hard to actually obtain this then it's rightfully mine right yeah and, that's interesting you know, it's a new concept right because i mean the the <laughs> traditional game developers would push back and say well we created the environment wherein you you know found value with this right, right. so if right. we take right. the environment why should we let you keep the assets you know right. uh, and then so how do you foresee that evolving to a space like even right now right i think rockstar just announced they're finally winding down gta 5 right after however many mm -hmm. millions or billions of dollars people have spent in that space i'm sure they won't completely do a hard shutdown but you know knowing right. there's nothing new coming um you know yep. how do you see a situation like that being maybe not avoided because there's nothing you can do if a developer team decides to shut down the central space right but maybe if you've bought digital assets and you have them you know in a 
decentralized wallet that can then be brought into another metaverse or into GTA 6 in this example, you know, <laughs> is that kind of the way you would see that kind of evolving? So in a way, yes. Um, <laughs> I kind of don't want to touch interoperability yet at the moment because right. we're still far off from that idea, yeah. right? But I think one of the ideas that I, I really love about blockchain is the composability of it. Um, we talk about IPs and the decentralized nature of like blockchain in general and people getting to own their assets, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen how Pudgy kind of created like a, a licensing um, idea um, yeah. where the board users... Too, right? Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where, 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 where users who actually have these specific traits can license these traits and earn a profit from, you know, um, the, 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 earn profits from the sales of these um, particular trade specific ones, right? And so kind of imagine like gaming having the same trend where if you are actually, or if you actually own an asset and I wanna use it for a different game, right? Or I wanna create content around it, or maybe even I personally would wanna create a content around it, then it can live on, right? It's not up to the developer to make sure that you know, the game lives on. It's up to me, especially if I'm attached to the uh, asset and I want to create like something out of it, something outside of the original creator, then I'm able to do so, right? right. So we are able to give life on, you know, assets that have already been deemed dead. And we've seen a lot of like projects being taken over by the community, projects being taken over by, you know, um, just active community members who really love like the IP or who really love like the character. And that ultimately is what I feel like um, is one of the biggest value adds of blockchain, especially when you attach it to IPs, because the death of the, or, or there's no real death for, for any kind of like IP. And it can live on as long as, you know, someone wants it and someone right. wants to, you know, give life to and it. So that's kind of the secret sauce is having that network effect, right? Having at least some right. kind of significant group of people that see the value in this space and the uh, value in these digital assets. And basically, sure. they're at least working among themselves. But obviously, the hope is that it would expand from there and others will see them yeah. having fun there and want to join and that kind of thing. And it's just a natural network effect, right? Yep. Awesome. For awesome. Sure. So maybe um, break down a little bit specifically, you know, what is Breeder DAO and the goal of Breeder DAO, you know, in the context of Web3 gaming and kind of this current space we're in, like you just mentioned, you know, it's kind of a, a quieter time right now. 99% of the guilds have shuttered because all the liquidity has gone. So, so how do you feel yeah. Breeder DAO is different? Um, and you mentioned a guild as well. Would that be through your Breeder DAO Discord or um, how do you join your guild? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, if you're a guild, then you can definitely just uh, enter Discord and we have like a, an, an exclusive um, group there only for guilds. Okay. Um, I'll give like a background about BreederDAO first. So okay. um, as mentioned, BreederDAO really started off with Axie Infinity. Um, we kind of focus on the playable asset kind of uh, side of things, right? Where, you know, developers are now more, op more open to instead of them creating all of the assets themselves, to let the individuals create these assets themselves. Now, mind you, this is a concept that isn't entirely new. We have merchants, blacksmiths, uh, all of those individual characters that have already existed since before. Um, it kind of just became like a, a bigger thing here because there was a cap in supply, right? Um, and I know that some of the drops are rare from before, but here there's an actual absolute not fixed number where we'll stop at like 10K. Right. Okay. And so it kind of became like, you know, uh, the, the proof of scarcity um, became like a big driver in terms of people being able to drive value to their assets. And so that's how we really started, right? Creating and producing playable characters, not only to provide to guilds, but also to provide liquidity to all of these markets so that people who would want to enter are able to do so, right? Um, so ultimately, the goal of Breeder DAO is to actually become what we would call like the factory of the metaverse, which means that um, the concept in itself shouldn't just stop within playable assets, right? Now, we started with playable assets in gaming because it was one of the most lucrative market, mm -hmm. and it was a common sense, right, for us to be able uh, to, to actually start there because there's already like a ready demand there. But as a project and as a, you know, as a, as a 
it's an individual who's driving um, where we want to go. Um, we believe that assets ultimately are the building blocks of you know this digital world and economy that we're trying to recreate, right? And so we've expanded since then. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, about AI skins and you know being able to craft skins as one of the most common, you know, assets that people would want to have um, is something that we've already developed as well. Now. In the future, we won't stop with playable characters or skins. It could be environment creation, um, anything under the sun that has to do with assets. That's the goal, right? So that's who we are and that's who we want to be. That's awesome. And when you say these assets, like, is the goal to have an economy around them or you're really just kind of like making it easy for creators to create them and then kind of build the economy? Because I noticed you have a skin shop, so I'm just bringing the AI skins uh, site up on the on uh, gotcha. the screen here for the audience. I'm wondering, right. you know, yeah, what's the kind of end goal for this? Is it like a economy specifically kind of buy and for breeder DAO? Or how do you see it kind of having network effect into Web3? Right, so there def there's definitely gonna be an economy, but it's not something that we would be actually closing um, within the ecosystem. So the goal of BreederDAO as always, or, 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 or since the beginning is to actually provide support to a lot of these projects, um, I guess to a lot of like these projects, right? And so um, where we see it eventually, and this is something that we talked about earlier, which is related to interoperability, right? Is that eventually people can move their assets across different spaces and, you know, Projects like AI Skins wouldn't just become like a creations platform, but also a distribution platform where we believe that eventually, however you want to look like, you know, maybe in a particular um, space or a particular game would be the same way as how you would want to look like in a different space or a different channel, right? And so we're exploring a lot in terms of like AI Skins touching on capabilities like physical merchandise or digital assets, touching on things like AR functionality. And the goal ultimately is to exist in all of these different spaces, not just limited to like web free games, but all of these digital and maybe even physical spaces that we exist. Because ultimately what we feel like assets ultimately bring to people would be identity, right? And at the core of it, right? Identity is something that we wanna bring everywhere. If I'm known for, you know, a red scarf in a particular game, then every time I enter like a new game, I would want to wear like that red scarf because it actually shows that I am me and that, you know, you're dealing with me and, you know, I can like see people that. are like, you know, vainish, mm -hmm. right? And so they actually want to, you know, be known and they want to be proud of their the character that they've actually honed and made. So yeah, that's the kind of like um, goal that we have, mm -hmm. um, not just but for 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 a lot of like you know the things that we do here that's awesome that's awesome and so like do you see that the adoption kind of moving in one direction or the other like i feel like there's almost this competition between web3 gaming and the metaverse even though they're obviously very similar like cousins but when i look at these digital assets right i look at them as wearables i would wear into decentraland for example or one of these are sandbox or something like that um whereas you know in the web3 gaming space i feel like the digital assets are a little more specific to a specific game right um so do you differentiate between kind of the metaverse and web3 games or do you like is it all just kind of the same big universe Right. So I think right now it's hard to actually just consolidate all of these things into one big, like huge universe. Mm -hmm. Now people are saying that eventually all of these metaverse are going to be connected and like, you know, you can transport one asset from one to another, but I think we're far off from there. Um, it's why in terms of how we're actually executing things, um, we're thinking on the side, both on the developers and the users, right? Um, we can't expect all of the developers to um, follow a singular standard where everyone is going to build off that, right? Or like everyone will have like the same dimensions, the same, you know, file format, and that's yeah. going to be, you know, a or we're able to transfer that from one world to another. And so what we're doing within um, our group is that every asset that you create, we already allow you to convert it into a different file format 
that can now be uploaded across different like platforms. Mm -hmm. So there's what you call like an AR export file, which can be used as like an AR filter um, on, on social media platforms like you know Instagram or Facebook. You have a .glb file, which as um, which you said uh, can be used like on the central end. You have a .box file or a .vxf file, which can be used for sandbox. So we're already laying down the groundwork to make it easy for both the developers and for the users to be able to use all of these assets across different platforms, even though their standards are quite different from each other. So instead of like letting them do the work of like converting it, of like, you know, allowing these assets, we're already doing that for them, wow. creating all sorts of like things at the back or uh, at the back end, and then just making it easy for them to, to, allow the users to enjoy the experience of bringing one asset from That's one awesome. world. So once you buy the NFT of these digital assets, you have the option to download the file type that you that you want, like between the voxel or the um, GLB or the other ones. Yeah, so we started with GLB, um, yeah. where we're actually in the process of creating or pushing out like uh, other stuff, like uh, that FBX file, which is m commonly used for Unreal games. Right, and Unreal, so we, a little bit higher fidel yeah. fidelity. Yep. So, so the goal is to actually allow or provide all of these um, asset types to the users or file formats, so that they're able to upload it in the different ones. Or if once we're ready with the integrations with all of these other games or all of these other worlds, then we can do it for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice that you know standards like six five five one or ERC six five five one already exist because now we can actually host these different NFTs under one, a singular NFT so that the experience for the user uh, is actually going to be seamless. And, you know, a lot of people have been saying that that's one of the biggest gaps right now, right. Um, at least gaming, right? Because the, the, the idea of like NFTs, especially with a wallet, you know, with having to trade it in a different platform outside of, you know, the games marketplace, um, kind of like discourages users from even entering, right? And so... Um, you know, building up the infrastructure uh, to allow for convenience uh, is is very crucial, especially if you want this um, to to really um, go mass, uh, reach mass, mass adoption. No doubt, that coveted mass adoption. <laughs> we hear it so much. Um, you know, I don't know what what's gonna what's gonna happen when we get there. I'm almost scared of what happens when we get there, but I'm happy with the building right now. You know, um, are you right. familiar with uh, Ready Player Me as a concept? Like they're kind of trying to take this interoperability yep. angle whereas you know obviously it's very centralized so there's that side right. of it um but it is you know they're signing up with different metaverses so if you have your one ready player me avatar you can jump into different metaverses with it would you say that's yep. kind of the right direction or how do you how do you view that concept you know i think it could be a step right being able to allow an avatar for example to be integrated across like different um worlds is a step in the right direction. Although how we're imagining it in the future is that you don't have to conform to a singular avatar or, or like to a singular form of avatar. In fact, you can just supposedly create whatever it is that you want. And with the advancement of AI, it can actually help you convert that or dynamically convert that into something that's readily available or readily usable for a particular platform. And so, you know, if you want to create like, I don't know, a cute penguin, for example, and then use that as your avatar. Most of the ones on Ready Player Me are like um, humans or human-like characters, right? right? And so if I'm like, if I want to be a, a penguin, like, and I don't want to be human, like, can I just be a penguin? <laughs> and so, you know, eventually I foresee that kind of idea where um, projects like Ready Player Me are going to take, take it a step further or, you know, some of the projects who are actually working on like these stuff right now are mm -hmm. going to take it a step further where you don't have to conform to a particular standard. It doesn't have to be like a human-like character. It can be whatever character you want. And then we use the power of AI to, you know, dynamically change the components within like a particular avatar uh, to make it responsive or to make it usable for a particular world. Oh, that's amazing. That definitely makes sense. Um, so I'm reading on your site talking about the asset creation side of what BreederDAO does um, and looking at, you know, being able to kind of enable generating NFTs that are really tailored to specification. So I know this kind of goes back to what you were saying about how 
you don't have to call it blockchain, right? You don't have to call it NFTs. Maybe and the technology just becomes so ubiquitous that you know NFTs are used as an asset, mm -hmm. like a special kind of asset within the game, but not necessarily like we're a Web three or we're NFT game. You know, um, how do you see that working? Like, and what do you mean when you say you know you generate NFTs tailored to specification? All right. So. Um... I'll break it down because it differ, uh, It kind of changes depending on what asset we're creating. Mm. On the playable asset side of things, which is you know the creation of axes, the creation of Pegasi, how we really started off was um, because there are like different traits, right, and different body parts. If you're like a guild who approaches us, uh, we'll ask you what you want, right? Is it you know a particular asset? Um, that contains these specific traits. If so, then we're able to create that for you. And there's an algorithm around that um, that allows you to, you know, increase the probability of a particular trait appearing, and for that to be able to use by you know different individuals. Now, I think you're familiar with this one, but the quality of the axi, the quality of the asset that you have, directly affects your earnings at least back then, right? right. And your ability to win in the game. It's kind of like determined as well by the, the quality of the asset that you have. Mm. So that one was crucial. And so tailoring that specific to the play style of the individual, as well as, you know, generally what are the strongest ones or the strongest like traits like within the game, um, became kind of like crucial, um, especially for the guild owners. Mm. Now, side of like the skins and wearables how we're actually tailoring it and if you've actually gone to the, the ai skins shop there's an upload functionality there where you can choose to you know have or or, or like upload your own print and that print will be actually used an, as an inspiration to be able to generatively create like um these 3d wearables um that you can now choose and select from right so having that um personalization aspect is how we make it like tailored to you know a user specification and we deem that uh, we deem that as like one of the most important facets because what's the point of like earning it if i can't really do anything about it or it's not actually to my liking right, right. if at the end of the day like these are all designed by I mean, I'm not okay. I mean, I'm I'm definitely not opposed to like people designing it for me, especially if it looks cool already. Mm. But like the optionality of being able to help in the creation process or to actually put some edits um just because you know I want to, right. um, is an option, right? And so that's what we're allowing people to do so. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I was tinkering around on the AI skins and tried to make my own, but it didn't work out. I don't know if I chose the wrong kind of uh, image or whatever, but no, it's really cool. Oh, and it's a really okay. cool concept, the idea that we'll it's kind of community-led. Sorry? We, we can work on that later. Oh, I yeah, can. I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, you mentioned Pegasy, Pegexy, or Pegexy. I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, Pegasy. I think yeah, do you, it reminds me of Zed Run. Are you familiar with Zed Run? Uh -huh, uh -huh, it's like another yeah. NFT based kind of horse racing game. Could you uh, break yep. down how Pegasi works and um, maybe how the NFT assets? So there's the racing side of it. So they're very cool, high tech for those listening on audio only. I have it up on the screen. They're very cool, high tech horses with wings, essentially Pegasus, obviously, um, but they uh -huh. look like robot style. And so you can right. race, you can breed and you can rent the horses. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about Pegasi and what Breeder Dow um, created with them. Sure. Um, it's like mecha horses, actually. Um, <laughs> meta horse so the, race. Let's go. Yeah, the, the, the concept is like pretty similar to how Axie did it, at least in terms of like the creation of assets. So in order to breed Axie, uh, in order to breed like Pegasus or Pegas, uh, you need to combine like um, a male horse and like a female horse, right? Mm. And so um, the idea um, is that you actually use these horses uh, and they each have like their own traits, right? And they have, you know, different elements as well. And the stadiums kind of differ, right? Now it's a passive horse racing game, at least back then when we were uh, producing assets for them. And okay. then a lot of people kind of like onboarded. So it's more of like watching a horse betting game um, right. and just betting horse, right? So but you um, own the horses are that are in it. So like the person that owns the horse can bet can generally win more is that how it works or it's just straight betting oh, on yeah, yeah yeah so so there was no betting involved at least during that time 
So mm-hmm. it was mostly if you win, then you actually get like the the share of the earnings, right? Um, but again, it was quite random because you have no participation right. in the it's in totally the, random like not what about yeah. your stats like do the stats of each pega like impact the oh, race yeah, the stats do affect yeah. the stats do affect it um you know high speed for example and even the breed of like the horses so there are certain breeds that are normally faster than the rest hmm. so people were optimizing all of these things as well but <laughs> because there's a the randomness to it right you don't really know and even the stadiums are kind of random so there's a lot of like elements going around it that that you know people kind of tried to optimize for especially to maximize their earning um right now i think they're developing or i think they've already launched the beta for um uh the horse racing game where you actually can actively participate oh. and you can kind of control um, or, or generate or create or, or activate like boost so that, you know, the, the user can also partake in, nice. in the racing nice. and I can actually get the timing like, down. Giving like a, a Mario Kart vibe, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and I guess like very timely, especially since, you know, we're on the road to making all of these games more fun and like having participation from like users in general. So yeah, that's where I think they're at. And, you know, the studio itself is quite interesting because they're not just developing one game and they're developing like multiple games. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really excited to see not only just them, right, but for all of these studios to start generating games that are not solely focused on the earning side of things, right. but on like games that people would actually game regardless. Actually have of fun, right? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And yeah, it's amazing. Um, that's interesting that they're focused on that. How do you think these studios are handling, you know, the market as it is right now? And to your point, maybe that's the calculation, right? It's like, okay, well, speculation's gone. You know, we can't really rest on this idea of like making a lot of money in this game. How do we get mm-hmm. people to play it and make these studios still, you know, function and worth it, right? And that the yeah. solution is make it more fun, right? So, so how that's are they right. navigating this kind of? adaptation because <laughs> they didn't seem honestly, to worry about that too much you know prior <laughs> yeah honestly for me it's actually pretty good uh, at least environment wise hmm. because the genre of like games that we've seen especially when actually infinity kind of boomed and like the entire game, uh, concept was play to earn right it was kind of like all similar right it was a copy of a copy of a copy now on a different chain or you know, maybe a different IP or a different character, right? Turn, you know, a particular asset, for example, from like a fish to a horse or a horse to a crab. That became like the the, the theme around, you know, um, gaming or at least blockchain gaming during that time. Mm. So we didn't really see like a lot of genre. We didn't really see a lot of innovation. Games were actually building games for the sake of, getting in early and writing the hype, right? It wasn't like games for games first, right? right? And so given the slowdown in the industry right now, like games are undergoing the same framework as how typical game studios would actually do it, right? Those that are just generally building um, a good game for the sake of like developing like a good game. And so for me, that's an improvement, right? Yeah, um, for because sure. that's ultimately what we're supposed to do right as game developers providing nice content for individuals where you know they want to which will provide like entertainment for them not in the form of like monetary but like in the form of like what an actual game should really do right um developments around you know apple uh, allowing for like nfts this time actually open up the gates for a lot of these developers as well because um you post like a good question how do i now reach the masses if it's not about like providing the aspect of like earning mm. um apple you know google have proven that they're able or that these platforms already immediately allow access to a broader audience and so like having your 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 game published there or like listed there um will automatically uh enable growth in terms of users and so these are the things that have been like uh pretty exciting for me and no a lot of individuals are just saying that they can't really wait for the next bull run right iterating but, for the know, next bull run i like that <laughs> yeah. like, you know, honestly um once we really you know take in blockchain as like a, a component of like game 
and not having to do with you know just the idea of like being able to earn from it right then it shouldn't matter whether it's bull or bear um i think games would be the first industry at least on the blockchain industry side that would be kind of like agnostic so whether it's bull or bear yeah. if you're able to create a good game then you know it's gonna drive like growth it's gonna drive like sales um for your assets yeah most definitely um I, I see that happening right now with the ones that are building out personally i've been watching this project called universe are you familiar with it no actually yeah so their <laughs> universe is um they've got some people from the grand theft auto 5 and rockstar team um like former you know like I don't know how many generations, one or two generations ago, um, kind of on the team along with a bunch of other kind of writers and builders. But it's been interesting the way they're teasing it out because they have been just kind of airdropping a lot of uh, tokens to their community. And then the tokens are like your early access, right? So you get a bunch of in-game currency for just for having the tokens. Um, and then they started slowly releasing like characters so you can get these characters and some are more rare than others. And they have a uh actual game like a demo kind of uh game of a shooter game where you're just like running around and using the actual character that you own so you're able to actually see your playable asset in a game that's running around and shooting um so yeah i'll send you a link for that one it's a pretty cool concept of um to the to your point about you know needing to make it fun and then the really? goal the hope is that as it becomes more and more fun those who were there early got all these super rare assets that are never available anymore right so they will you know, in theory, go up in value in the future. But also, they just have a whole bunch of utility within the game that gives them some special perks and stuff. So it's also more fun and potentially more valuable. Although them too, I've heard, you know, as far as budgets go, it's still a little bit difficult because you're, you're always kind of relying on sales on the blockchain to actually make that revenue, yeah. you know? Um, so yep. it's interesting. And I was wondering, do you have a kind of favorite type of Web3 game? Do you see a certain type working more than others? You know, I've seen a lot of like game collector uh, card games kind of i've seen a lot of kind of trial type games like um the one that the board apes released which looked kind of cool dookie dash that might be one of the funner right. ones i've seen released um universe that i was just mentioning is kind of a first person shooter but they're also going for a broader kind of adventure game uh kind of look yeah and you know we just talked about pegasus and there's zed run as well which are kind of like randomized horse racing games <laughs> so there's a lot of different kind of web3 games out there already actually um do you have a certain kind that's like resonating with you or that you see the most potential in well i don't think it's any different from you know general web2 games um mm -hmm. i'm still pretty bullish on like you know generally fps as well as like combat rpg games right. um there's not going to be any distinction for me in the future. And as long as like we build out games that are actually really fun and like up to their liking, then I think it would make sense for, for, for us to kind of like merge both web two and web three game under one umbrella. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's inevitable, especially once you have like games that have actually proven, um, to, to also work despite having like a blockchain component yeah. i think it's inevitable that you know it's a win-win for the well i guess it's a huge win for the users if they're able to really own their assets right um and if they can actually choose to sell it um outside of like the the the, the game developer itself right we've seen a lot of like games um banning like secondary sales um yeah because ultimately, um you know it's less revenue for the developers but i think you know users deserves more right yeah and, and like, people often find ways around those which you know i've also heard from those criticizing yeah. web3 like i already sell my assets it can be done it's like yeah technically yeah. you can yeah. but you're not actually right. owning it in your own sovereign way on the on the yes, blockchain exactly. or in any real way you don't actually own it you know you're just yeah. skirting sure. the rules and, and swapping wallets with somebody else for a cost you know <laughs> something like that yeah, i um, think it's underrated just because you can you can do it right now doesn't mean you can do it perpetually right. um i think what's what's really underrated right now in blockchain is that we're making it the same for everything right and so you might be able to do it in this game just because you've already studied through the economy and then le learned the ropes of it but like try doing that for another game right you would need to go through the same exercise right. as you did before yeah that's Whereas a lot of time and effort just to know just to figure out how you might right, be able right. to sell something and hopefully you don't right. get caught and they take away all your shit <laughs> right 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 yeah, right. yeah, so, yeah crazy. I mean, <laughs> eventually it's going to be like something that people would assume to be a given fact right and so now games who actually have a different um approach would then be criticized right so right now we're criticized for our approach but eventually it's going to be the opposite right
I like it. I like it. And, you know, I'm still waiting for that kind of Mass Effect vision of like, it's like just going around the universe and finding random resources and actually being able to like buy and sell them and have those resources connected to different assets. Um, right. One that I've seen actually looking towards that from the closest I've seen so far is Star Atlas, which is actually on Solana. So I was going to ask you, you know, how do you feel about other blockchains? I know I've definitely seen you guys have a pretty close connection with Polygon. And I know uh, Pegasi and I believe Axie as well are using Matic and the layer two Ethereums in general. I've seen avalanches coming along quite a bit too um they seem to be kind of leading the pack for sure and definitely in the whole metaverse conversation ethereum's kind of the only game in town almost it seems like mm -hmm. which is kind of sad but that's that's the way it seems to be right now so how do you feel right. about blockchains in general do you have a, a favorite um and how do you see it kind of evolving from here well you know personally um I mean, personal bias is that I always gotta go for like ETH just because it has proven history yeah um and we all know like ETH really has like the highest liquidity among all of these other chains, right? Of course. But as a gamer, honestly, I don't think like, you know, a singular chain will, will kind of dominate it, right? Or, or, you know, honestly, people don't even need to know like what chain it's on, right? As long as it does That's the true. work, um, then you should be able to play it, right? It's one of the things that I mentioned earlier where user experience has to come first and definitely creating all of these chains and, you know, siloing ourselves or making it exclusive for that particular chain is it gonna cut it which is why most of the people right now are actually making it chain agnostic as well or they kind of like start off like with one chain and then eventually like you know allowing for all of the other evms or even like you know the solana ones to also mm -hmm. participate because a game isn't supposed to like you know, block people off or you wouldn't want people blocked off just because they don't understand like a particular chain. You're not even selling the chain at this point. You're just simply selling the game. And so for us, we work with all sorts of games. We work with all sorts of like assets. Um, it doesn't matter to us whether you're actually the only um, game that's building on, you know, say Aptos or, or Sui, right? We all know that's not true, but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we'll work with you, right? Because cool. uh, as mentioned, like our goal is to become the factory of the metaverse. And it's not just going to be a factory of like, you know, a singular chain. It's going to be like every single one that's actually building here. I and we want to be able to support and cater to their needs as well. You know, right? And as much as I have, you know, some criticisms of Axie Infinity, overall, the idea that kind of the, the place that benefited economically from Axie Infinity and kind of that original boost of Web3 Gaming would then give birth to the factory of Web3 Gaming. You know, I think it's it's For right. Sure. You know, it just feels right. Because <laughs> now, you know, there's all kinds of abundance and value and opportunity that's going to come from that. Um, and I can see what you're doing, like breederdow.io. Everyone check it out. It's definitely really impressive. Um, I can see the vision. I can see, you know, where you're heading and definitely having that resume of Axie Infinity and a few other titles that have been fairly successful um, will help you kind of springboard into the future. I did want to speak on the specific DAO angle of it, right? So I noticed, you know, you're the chief executive officer, you clearly have kind of an executive board function, which a lot of DAOs do. Um, but the DAO as a decentralized autonomous organization does also kind of lean into empowering community right and the idea right. that everyone within your DAO has a voice um, so how do, how important are DAOs you think um, and how is breeder DAO kind of handling the governance side of things right I think eventually DAOs could play like a huge role uh, especially when determining or running all of these organizations right um, but I think it's also worth noting that right now um, people are like like as community member i'm involved with probably a hundred different DAOs, right wow and you know it's not like i can really focus on a particular DAO and really drive growth for a particular DAO outside of maybe the major decision making ones right mm. so for me right now at least like for most DAOs, and i'm not gonna you know exclude ours because i feel like we're also encountering the same issues and the same criticism right mm -hmm. DAO holders are more of like your shareholders at this point where they kind of are invested in the growth of the community and the growth of like the project in general but they can't really have like an active or, or that big of an active participation to really drive the growth uh, of 
you know any project mm. it's why a core team is still needed it's why you know even though you or even though you know we we start or we call ourselves like a dao we're not fully decentralized we're not fully autonomous we don't hand over like everything to the community mm. because it doesn't make sense right people actually join the project and even purchase a token because they kind of believe in the leadership and even though we say that we want a fully democratized one, right, or a fully decentralized one, we mm. all know that people have their own biases and they choose to follow uh, more than lead, right? <laughs> so it's going to take a, a step further to be able to really achieve like a, a proper DAO, one that's, you know, really a flat structure and, you know, people are the ones governing it this, uh, instead of just like a, a few individuals at the top. But you know, I think it's a process, right? And, yeah. you know, like for us, we can't just hand it over to them without even knowing who they are, right? <laughs> At this point, yeah. we don't even know, like, who's qualified to be able to lead this. And, you know, part a huge part of the DAO would also be your investors, right? right. So you owe it to your investors to actually lead them to success. And definitely just, you know, putting it up in the air and just saying that, you know, we're a DAO. And so, you know, we're not supposed to be taking charge in terms of where we want to drive the growth of this one. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite irresponsible, uh, at least uh, in my perspective, right? No, and so, it. yeah, eventually I think DAOs would make sense, um, especially once you have worlds where, you know, there's n like, like it's, it's already self-sustaining. People are creating all sorts of things within your world, right? Um, right. Or, or like, you know, digital economy um, is become something that everyone kind of like assumes to be uh, a given fact, right? Um, but yeah, I think DAOs are are especially crucial right now because they're your community base, right? And mm -hmm. um, even if you know they're not as active, um, the way they actually participate in it should tell you what actually matters to them, right. and what matters to them kind of is very important right now especially for a product that hasn't reached like a product market fit right and we're all just looking for um that product market fit and who knows right we don't even know if this particular market is going to be the market that we're really going to be catering to you know one to two years down the line especially <laughs> you're ready to adapt market. yeah and once a bull market comes and another set of like individuals gets interested in the space right. you know so yeah but like these core individuals are actually pretty crucial for me because these are the guys who are really in a way in it for the tech right and understands or despite you know experiencing a bear market didn't necessarily just leave and you know decided that it's not worth their time right so right. these are people who are going to stay and it's nice to actually you know be in touch with them and you know get that sense of what's important to them and how can we as a community and maybe even as a DAO um, improve so that we stay relevant and we become important to the next generation who are going to be uh, involved in this process. Yeah, oh, wow. oh, that's amazing. You dropped a lot of gems there, I think, on the concept of DAOs and the realities of DAOs as well. And definitely, I like that you, you kind of spoke of the need for a leadership team. And uh, I'm on a few DAOs as well, definitely not 100, but I'd say five or six, maybe <laughs> uh, on the leadership team of one or two as well. And uh, one that has folded recently, unfortunately. Um, but to your point, you know, it's like, there's always some kind of point of centralization. I think it's necessary, um, but I'm looking at your site and you've got a pretty big team, you know, at least on the breeder Tao, breeder Dow leadership, you know, and I think that's important too, right? How important is it to have at least with your leadership team, you know, five to seven to 10 people, you know, how important are, is a diversity of voices as well? Women to men, maybe different backgrounds. Um, yeah. So how, how have you kind of navigated that governing um, and representing, you know, the best you can um, on the leadership team? All right. So I think it depends on the needs of the business for sure. Um, but the way we thought about it is that every single facet needs to be properly represented, right? Mm -hmm. We have someone who's actually in charge of people and DAO specifically, because we believe that the that the that the road from you know the community to us is kind of a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. You don't expect like everyone to just simply message me and for me to be able to respond to all of these um, inquiries, right? So having someone to facilitate and collecting those voices um, is very crucial, you know. 
um, most of it is actually taken off like the the typical um, startup like leadership team where you have people like finance, you have people like operations, and it depends really on like where your or where your business is headed and how you're thinking through things. For us, you know, of course, tech is always a given, right? Um, we're a blockchain company for a reason. We're creating products um, that involves technology, right? Stuff like finance, for example, uh, these are things that people might think um, is secondary, um, and it's. A, but but why is it actually very crucial for us? Because like treasury management, first and foremost, is something that people don't kind of like give um, minds into, or they actually think that it's something secondary to them. But I mean, you won't even last long if you don't do proper treasury management. And again, like you owe it to people, right? To be able to perfectly manage your treasury instead of just buying like all of these shit coins or like buying all of these ETH. Well, and for um, some oh, DAOs, it's even getting to a point where your treasury has liquidity, right? Where it has something, you know? Right, um, right. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, I guess like it really depends, right? On, mm -hmm. on the goal of the, 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 the project or the business. But for us, it's really like understanding who we're catering to, what we're actually delivering, um, to 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 the individuals and then how do we make sure that you know we we get like the most perspectives or the most number of perspectives as much as possible so that we're able to in a way cover like all fronts and consider all possibilities right amazing amazing uh well we're going to slowly start winding down here but i do appreciate these insights it's really amazing um, i'm looking at your your website and it's kind of talking about inclusiveness humility uh, i kind of jumped over to the governance side of breeder dow and i'm wondering um what's the reach of breeder dow right now i think everybody in web3 at least especially if you're interested in the gaming side of web3 is familiar with axie infinity you know and personally i always loved the story of how web3 gaming was like you just said at the beginning of our interview making opportunities opportunities for people who were really hard on their luck and especially during covid you know you kept hearing those good stories um then you heard some of the not so good side of things too but overall the idea of creating opportunities seems to be huge right and specifically in the right. philippines but how international is breeder dow you know i'm definitely you know creating economic opportunity in the philippines it seems most of your team leadership team seems to be based there what is the vision for kind of the global inclusivity of breeder dow Right. Actually, our network is quite global at the moment. Yeah, um, nice. You can see, even though like most of the team is actually based off here, just because it's much easier to yeah. communicate working off like the same time zone, right? We have individuals um, who are actually based uh, based out of South America and other like Asia Pacific regions, right? Nice. So for us. Um, if you look at the base of investors that we have, it's actually quite holistic. Uh, a bit biased towards the West, but in general, there's actually a lot of individuals there um, that are from different countries, right? And so um, we actually have that global inclusiveness from the get-go. And you know the community itself, we never gate keep, we never gate kept it uh, mm. to to you know just Filipinos, of right? Course, yeah. The reason why it makes sense for us to actually have a leadership team here and to have like most of the individuals based out of here was because a huge part of like the business, at least at the start, were driven by guilds, right? And most of the guilds were actually born out of like the Philippines as well. Okay. So it more or less made sense to actually um, establish like a team here or persons here um at least with a with a team side but yeah. you know we're actually working with a lot of games a lot of like projects who are not based out of here in fact most of them are not based out of here because there are only a handful of real projects that are based out of the philippines but mm. yeah um we're, we're definitely uh in contact with them um in terms of like games we're partnered with over 40 most of which are based actually none of which are based out of the philippines um okay. and so we're global and and we're really trying to as mentioned earlier um we're really trying to become the factory of the metaverse that's agnostic you know and that's one of the beauties of blockchain right mm -hmm. even though you come from like the philippines there's no like blocking you geographically right to that's be able it. to meet like, the borders are gone in the metaverse exactly exactly i mean I, I, as long as you have the internet then you can actually be connected with someone from abroad right and okay. so we're, we're taking the same approach right we're not gonna be biased towards specific countries 
um, I mean, maybe in terms of like go to market, right? Uh, especially where the demand is, mm -hmm. but like we're not gonna block off anyone for participation or for participating, uh, especially if they choose to do so, right? Awesome. You can think of as a community of like people who are just really invested um, in, in the creation of like assets and maybe even distribution of it uh, across the different digital spaces. Awesome, awesome. Um, and how is it in, well, the Philippines specifically, and then maybe in the more general area as well, looking at the evolution of Web3, the adoption of Web3, you know, obviously Axie Infinity made a huge splash in the Philippines, but beyond that is Web3 as a technology kind of taking off in the country? Um, and, and how is it, you know, as a network, you know, to your point about needing to have things more community-based, more community-based guilds, um, I think it starts at the local level, right? IRL in real life, you know, uh, yeah. speaking to right. people on the ground. So what's the general kind of feedback that you get when talking about Web3 and blockchain to uh, the average uh, Filipinos? <laughs> so, well, typically we don't even like say that, you know, it's blockchain <laughs> right. because we feel like that's a already like create that already creates like a huge friction point, right? Mm. If you led with like, or if you lead with like terms that as an individual, I don't even understand anymore, then why am I even talking to you, right? right? And, you know, even though adoption was quite huge here um, when Axie Infinity first onboarded, right? People didn't necessarily understood like what blockchain has to offer aside from, you know, I can sell my assets. In fact, I don't even know if they understood that it was blockchain that enabled for that functionality. Right. Because as long as they're getting the funds, then I don't really care like what's powering it, right? <laughs> the same manner as like people don't really understand what goes behind like the internet because we were actually just born into it, right? right. Being able to talk to you right now, I don't understand like how Google actually you know, projects my image to yours, right? Or your image to mine. It's just, <laughs> it was just handed to me and I'll take it, right? right? And so, you know, I think a lot of like the building is happening more on the infrastructure side. Um, and maybe even to a certain extent, like utility um, for, for the technology itself. Because DeFi is one, right? Decentralized finance. It was actually like a huge use case because... Right. You know, you, you reduce like the operational inefficiencies, having to go to a bank, having to subject yourself to, you know, operating hours, having to, you know, build that relationship with account managers and the like, right? Um, so I think like um, two things. The first one would be reducing like friction um, for people to enter. Um, treating it the same as like, you know, internet where it's already an underlying technology that I don't really have to understand for me to be able to participate in or for me to be able to use it. And then the second would be, you know, just generally creating utility for different individuals on how it can actually improve their lives or how it's actually a step higher um, that one than, than what they have right now. So conversations like, you know, maybe this is something that blockchain can empower. Um, we've spoken with the likes of, you know, World Health Organization right. on how they can maybe um, <clears throat> store their database in the blockchain so that at least um, it's immortalized and, and you're not actually relying on local servers to actually store it and that anyone who would want to verify it can actually verify it. Now, these are use cases that we feel like blockchain can definitely um, provide, but because like there's a lack of, you know, um, infrastructure that can provide the ease uh, in terms of like making these happen, then mm. we're not yet there, right? So yeah. eventually we feel like once we start building up the infrastructure, then these conversations are going to be easy because we don't have to actually tell them that it's run by blockchain, right? It's also why Telegram bots are becoming a thing because, you know, of course, like security and owning your seed phrase is actually very important and all of that. Mm. But as a user, do I really want that, right? Or do I want, or or am I okay with a with a with a with a bit of like centralization, um, just to be a able custodial to, wallet or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to be able to ease that, you know, onboarding experience for me, right? right? We all know that, you know, the same as how we actually treat centralized versus decentralized entities, right? Some people just want what's convenient, right? It doesn't matter whether yeah. it's not like 
government's out to get me that I have to protect all my seed phrases, right? I'm a small fish in the pond. And so why do I have to go through all of these hassle just to be able to participate in this, right? So there's a lot of things going around here. And yeah. ultimately, you know, users just want it easy, right? And and making it easy would be the first and foremost the, thing that we should the do. The convenience is the uh, enemy of sovereignty, maybe, though, <laughs> right? It's like the more convenient yeah. you want it, the less sovereign it becomes. And then, you know, not your yes. keys, not your cryptos, not your keys, right. not your NFTs, you know? <laughs> I mean, it might take a while, right? But we yeah. can't just completely go from a centralized one to a decentralized one. For maybe sure. take like... That's, you know, like as long as that off ramp is clear, right? As long as you got yeah, that clear yeah, off ramp yeah. to the blockchain, you can get out right, of the custodial right. wallet. No, that's amazing, yep. man. I, I'm totally there with you. Um, so last or one of my last questions, looking at the creator economy and this idea of the digital assets kind of buying and selling, you know, like that's what really pulled me into NFTs and the metaverse. You know, mm -hmm. how important is it to you, the the creator economy side of it, like the, the building and then the selling and, and um, really creating your own little micro economy within the metaverse? Like, how do you see that evolving and how important do you think the creator economy is uh, to Web3 gaming? Right. Well, I think in general, the creator economy is one of the biggest growing industries, right? Like, um, even though i'm from the philippines right i've seen and experienced like a lot of these larger artists um kind of like also participating and lowering themselves down just to become like greater economy just because like the potential is much larger right mm -hmm. and in fact even businesses here um on the on the more traditional side aren't even looking at like the bigger names anymore they're just trying to look at micro mac uh, micro influencers to actually bring their product to market because conversion rates are higher right mm. and so i'm seeing the same thing happening here because eventually people will have different wants different needs and a particular personality wouldn't really be able to catch all of them right instead of trying to go for like a singular person uh, a singular in a uh, single individual where you allocate or your all your budget into why not just go with you know 10 of those um who have different cohorts or who have different profiles and then reach like a, a better target right so individuals or a creator creators having their power um especially in the digital space to create and to be able to share it with their users is definitely gonna be like a big thing in the future and since a lot of them are actually in the digital space right already then um what's the fastest way to deliver all of these goods and and, and projects and and assets than you know them being digital themselves in nature right and you know we imagine a world where eventually maybe digital assets would be given more importance than physical ones right where our digital identity is actually more crucial and our physical one just because our digital identity can go anywhere and everywhere and no our identity is limited by the resources or by the scarce resources that we have here which by the way is already slowly depleting so yeah um in a way you can think of it as like how we seen like ready player one implemented there where people would just you know maybe have like a bed and maybe have some food but <laughs> most of the even the businesses are actually done online and digitally and yeah. uh, that could be a potential future right although i do think maybe not to that extent but it could be a possibility right we yeah do that's all more like ready player one right there that's a little ready dystopian player, okay. <laughs> so, 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 so yeah like like that's the idea right yeah, no, you're not the first guest to make that um, that statement about, you know, maybe it's the other way around. And it's really, you know, the difficulty is being pulled back into reality and that we're spending a lot right. of time in the digital world, you know. But um, at that point, what is even real, right? So yeah, exactly, right. And that's the other point that's been made by others as well on this show is it's not, shouldn't even be calling it in real life versus not real, right? Because the digital life is just an extension of your real life. It's not like it's right. not real. It's just as real, you know, yeah. when we're talking to people in video game worlds those are real people you're talking with and having you know different interactions with so most definitely just a, a new layer of reality for sure um, well i think we hit on a lot of important notes here i'm really i'm um, excited about what breeder dow is working on i thank you so much Renz, for joining and really uh dropping these gems um especially i like the blockchain agnostic piece and how you want to be the factory of the metaverse uh, i definitely wish you success in that uh, in that goal and i think it's a good ambitious goal to have and it's awesome that you know you're based in the philippines you're bringing 
economic you know engine to the philippines and more value into the whole space globally um, so it's really exciting is there any uh, final words you want to share or any points you want to make before we wind down here um well first and foremost it's been a pleasure talking to you david um for us like if you really love like what we do then join us uh in in the charge right so i mean don't just wait for the bull market before like you know saying that it's actually worth your time to participate in it because we're building out the infrastructure to be able to allow for you know greater mass adoption right so oh, we're working hard so that eventually people don't have to actually go through the same route as us don't have to experience these things um and if you love that like join us as early as now so Sweet. yeah thank you so much david Thank you. It's all about getting more bodies into the metaverse, you know, and I'll definitely be jumping into that discord. Uh, everyone can check out their website at breederdow.io, or you can follow Renz on Twitter at R-E-N-Z underscore B-D-A-A-O, B-Dow. Renz from Breeder Dow, head breeder in chief. <laughs> um, it's awesome. Well, thank you for joining from the Philippines and um, really excited about this opportunity to talk to you. And I hope that our audience has gained a lot of knowledge and uh, we'll be back next week live from the metaverse. Until then, we'll catch you all in the metaverse. Peace out, everybody. Thank you, David.